Hasn't it been great stories that we've heard today? I, I personally um, was really affected by Lindsay's um, story. I know when my father died, um, God really made a, a huge difference in that none of us were left alone. Um, traveling around the world to, to be back to Australia to um, be there for the funeral. But God made it possible that every one of us, wherever we were traveling from, was with someone. And it sounds to me that the same kind of thing was happening with, with Lindsay there. Isn't God wonderful? He, he cares. God is a good God. And I think we need to remember that again and again and again. So as um, Peter has already said, we're about to start another uh, mini-series based on the five marks of mission. So if your memory is good, you'll remember earlier this year, we spent uh, three weeks looking at sharing the good news, and then we had a church-wide conversation about that topic. Um, we're about to kick off now with the next of the marks of mission, which is nurturing uh, nurturing followers of Jesus. Thanks, Penny. Yeah, we can't afford, can't afford to forget the chocolates, can we? So I see the mic is flashing and the battery is about to die. Um, it does talking, look like that. I will not be silenced. <laughs> well, I'm not sure how to get out of it. <laughs> so, in a bigger voice, we're looking at the nurturing followers of Jesus. And as we think of that as a, a, an idea, as a topic, uh, we can understand the discipleship is another way of saying the same thing. So that's what we're going to be spending a few weeks on starting today, and then we'll have another uh, church conversation around this topic. And when we have that church-wide conversation, we'll give you the feedback from the first one that we had so that it starts to build up a conversation around this idea of the, the Mark's mission. Thanks, David Wesley. That's fantastic. So... When we think of these marks of mission, we're understanding that any church that is wanting to follow Jesus, wanting to become more like Jesus, are going to exhibit these marks of mission in their life. And so as we talk about them, we also want to celebrate where that's true for us. And so listening to Phil's story, uh, and not all of her story relates to church at 126, obviously, but... She is part of our family, and we want to celebrate where discipleship has been true in her life, and we can learn from that at the same time. And we'll hear more stories as we go along. So when we think of, of the marks of mission, we, we think also of the great commission that Jesus uh, gave his followers at the end of Matthew in chapter 28. And so... This is something that I'm sure you've um, heard many, many times, but I'm going to read it out one more time for us. Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, there's a, a sense that the five marks of mission that we're going through can be derived from this great commission. And clearly, discipleship is an obvious one where we get the reference there. So when we think of, of Jesus and his ministry on earth and his example of discipleship, we have the Gospels. Now, you probably recognize these characters. Um, these are the same uh, people that Nigel uh, was showing us in the clip last week uh, from The Chosen. So I've, I've grabbed one of their um, photos. This is Jesus walking along with his disciples. And when we asked the question earlier on, what does discipleship mean to you? We've got a strong sense of this 
mentoring of this relationship uh, being a full-time immersive process. And certainly that was true for Jesus and his disciples for three years as they traveled and saw Jesus living a life being led by God and modeling what their life should be as well. And so they didn't understand all of that through those three years. And it was only after Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension, and the Holy Spirit came into this world and into their lives that they were actually able to understand in a fuller way what Jesus had led them to, what he had done, and why he had done it. But the discipleship was life. It wasn't a course that was on a Wednesday and Friday night for two hours in the evening, and then you, you stopped and then lived the rest of your life because that's what you had to do. This was living a whole life, and in their case, living that with Jesus side by side, shoulder to shoulder. So as we think about discipleship and we think of the Great Commission, I've just highlighted a couple of phrases there in what we've read out. Go and make disciples. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. Now, in one evening, there is no way that anybody can encompass all the ideas of discipleship, and I'm certainly not going to try and we've got three Sundays allocated to this, and even that's not going to be enough to deal with all the concepts of discipleship. But what I'm going to be looking at this evening is the teaching part of discipleship. So bear in mind, this is not trying to cover everything about discipleship, but looking at this teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, part of the Great Commission. So when we think about teaching, and understanding. I think uh, we need to pick up what the priorities are for us. So in Proverbs, a, a well-known verse for, for many of us is, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. We in ourselves don't get it. We're not enough. And so we need to be taught. We can't rely on our minds because they are very limited. I know mine is very limited and yours may not be quite so much, but we all need to have teaching in our lives to be able to become more like Jesus. Psalm 119 has many, many verses and I've just picked um, two verses from it. And you could have picked many other verses and also many others from different Psalms. This says, teach me your decrees, O Lord, I'll keep them to the end. Give me understanding and I will obey your instruction. I will put them into practice with all of my heart. And this is what we're being asked to do. So this is not just an intellectual exercise where we absorb some knowledge and say, got it, on to the next thing. That's more like the course where we do it for a bit of our time. But this is a whole of life, whole of heart experience where we take on what God has to teach us and we live it with all of our hearts. Four oh four. Anybody who's done a, a web search and seen that come up? What does it mean? Error, can't find it. Yeah. So what do you think the, the significance of the number 404 would be in relation to teaching and discipleship? I'm not really expecting you to get it. 126 one, is another number. Yeah. In Sunday school, the answer was always Jesus. Um, in our setting, we're saying 126. No, 404 is the number of times teach comes up in the Bible. Teach. So that could be teacher, teaching, teach, taught, um, but 404 times. Okay. So I just thought that was interesting given the number of times I've seen 404 <laughs> on a screen when I've tried to uh, do a, an internet search and it hasn't worked. And so my understanding wasn't improved, but teach in the Bible is something that's seen as an important word. The number of times a word pops up in the Bible uh, gives a sense of its priority, of its importance for us in terms of our understanding. So when you think of a word like uh, Lord and God, um, 
those words pop up thousands of times in the Bible, um, unsurprisingly. Uh, Jesus pops up only a couple of thousand times with the name Jesus because it's only in the New Testament, but um, you could find more examples. Um, in relation, there are about um, 2,000 verses in the Bible that relate to money. Okay, so seven, 8,000 God, 2,000 money, 400 teach. But if you add word instruct, you get another 300. So, you know, <laughs> you can play with words to your heart's content, can't you? And, and make them say what you want to. But it's an important thing. It happens a lot in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, what we teach others, what we are taught, and whether we are taught well is something that God cares very much about. So if you look at it, the broad sweep of history, very broad sweep, you've got the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and we get the sense that God is teaching Israel who he is and how they should live, how they should live for others. And we get the story of how that happens throughout the Old Testament, the good, the bad, and very much the ugly in those stories. And then we come to the time of Jesus' ministry, his time on earth, and Jesus is teaching his disciples. And we have a model of discipleship, of teaching that we can follow as well. And as Jesus leaves this world, um, and ushers in a new age, we have the time of the new covenant, and this is where we are today. And so God's church has been created to fulfill God's mission in this time. And so we saw from the Great Commission the requirement to make new disciples and to teach them to obey Jesus' commands. So this is the time that we're in. And so when we think of teaching, of discipleship, of church, we need to recognize that God has called his church, his people gathered together to fulfill a mission that he has given the church to, to do. And when that mission is fulfilled, which is not down to us to say it's done, but when God says it's done, Jesus will return. And at that point, everyone will know God, and there will be no need to teach each other, because everybody will know. So that's the vision, the future point, mission success. But we are not there today, and we've got a long way to go, and we need teaching. We need discipleship. We need to become more and more like Jesus. But it's not all smooth sailing. If it was, uh, we'd have some nicer stories to tell, perhaps. But even in the New Testament, there were problems when it comes to this teaching. And one of those problems was um, explained in, in 1 Corinthians that's up on the screen there. So Paul has, has established a church. That's his role. He, he, he's a pioneer. He creates uh, church families, brings people together in the name of Jesus that weren't together before, people who didn't know who Jesus was. And he spends time with them. He establishes them with the foundations of knowing who Jesus was, what he did, who he is, and what he will do. And then he moves on to another area. And, of course, the church family stays, which is what it's meant to do, because it has a job to make disciples in the area where that church is. And teachers come in to assist in that role. And in this story in Corinthians, there's a dispute because some people say, oh, I was taught by Paul. And so I got the real information. I got the real knowledge. I'm a step up on you because you've only been taught by Apollos. And other people were saying, ah, no, no, I've got the latest information and the best information because I've been taught by Apollos. And you got the basic stuff, fine, but that was just Paul. And it was creating problems in the life of the church. And so Paul wrote to, Corinth, to the Corinthians to say, step back. What are you arguing about? Whether it's Paul or Apollos or Murray or Bruce or whoever it is, the mission is more important 
than the person. Because the mission that we're on is to make disciples, to encourage people to become more like Jesus, to know who Jesus is and to have their lives transformed. And whether it's Paul or Apollos that, that seem to, to make the crucial decision point happen or to get the milestone ticks in the growth of the life of the church is irrelevant because it's a mission that's been given by Jesus for us to fulfill together. And so to be consumed by, I follow this one or that one, or I heard the right news from this one or that one is a total distraction. And it's not what discipleship is meant to be, but it's recognizing that we are on a mission from God to become more like Jesus and to introduce people to Jesus so that they can become more like Jesus. And this is what this discipleship cycle is all about. So Paul writes to the Ephesians and he says, these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church and he lists them out. And pastors and teachers are included in that list and recognize a gift given to the church, not necessarily a job to be done by a few people on behalf of the church, but rather a gift given to the church. And the reason that it's a gift like this is their responsibility to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So the people who've been tasked by God to be pastors and teachers, their job is to build up the church family, not to go out into the community on behalf of the church family so that the rest of the church family can just sit and say, we do a good job, but not actually do anything at all. But quite the opposite, to equip each one of us to be able to fulfill the call on our lives that God has given us. That's the job of the pastors and teachers. And this is the role of discipleship that we're talking about. How many times have we been involved in churches, and every one of us will have different stories, where a few people in the church have been very active and doing some wonderful things, and everyone else says, oh, well done. And then they talk to their friends and say, oh, our, ch our church does this, that, and the other. But they don't actually do anything themselves. This passage leaves no room for that kind of attitude. We are to be built up by the people that God has given us so that our church family uh, comes to full maturity, so that we, each one of us, can become more and more like Jesus. And this is the role of discipleship. So it's not to say that everybody should want to be a teacher because not everybody is called to be a teacher. Not everybody is called to be a prophet. Not everybody is called to be an evangelist. Some people are called to each of these roles. And so James wrote, brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. So don't take it on lightly. If you're being called to be a teacher, then take it seriously. Because what you teach will be judged by God. Where it comes from, what your heart is, is pushing out, will be assessed and judged by God more strictly than those who are listening to the teaching that you provide. So don't take this on lightly. Don't not do it either, but recognize that this is an important role that God gives some people to take on. And so if you're called to teach, to be a discipler, as many of us are, then do it seriously, carefully, and recognize that God cares about this and there is an assessment at the end of the day. And also recognize that this is a mission that is not for eternity. Hebrews chapter 8 is quoting from Jeremiah and talking about a time in the future. 
and they'll not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. We do need to do these things today. But in that day, everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says God. This is what we're working towards. When Jesus returns and sin is defeated and all is made well, everyone will know who God is. Not just know about God, but they will know God. And we won't need to teach each other at that time. The mission will be fulfilled. But now, today, the mission is full steam ahead. So many people need to know who Jesus is. So many people who are new to the faith, who have just had their lives transformed, need to be discipled, to have those foundations laid to become strong followers of Jesus. And every single one of us needs to continue to become more like Jesus, without exception, because none of us have arrived and won't until that day. But that day is coming, and there is a lot of hope in that. At that point, the mission is complete, and I'm sure we will be given a different mission to take on, because we'll be working for God. But right now, Discipling is critical. It's the sort of thing that if we don't do it, we will get a 404 error <laughs> because it really matters. So a question for us to think about in our context today to discuss around the tables. What area of teaching does Church at 126 need to grow and be mature. Okay, so it's a bit of a tough question because it's asking, what aren't we doing? What kind of teaching are we missing that we could be doing? So I'm not expecting a, a whole ream of answers because that would be very disappointing. <laughs> but there may be something that's on your heart and we need to know. Because we want Church of 126 to grow, to become more like Jesus, to be mature, to be who God wants us to be. And we need teaching. So spend some time discussing that around the table and let's see what we had to say.